Aman is a 60-year-old male who came into the clinic with shortness of breath and lower limb edema for the past three months. He has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and chronic alcohol use. On auscultation, an additional S3 sound is heard. An echocardiogram is performed, which shows dilated ventricular chambers and a reduced ejection fraction. Alexandra is a 23-year-old professional volleyball player who came into the clinic after multiple episodes of passing out during her games. At first, she presumed it was due to dehydration, but she's now concerned. She has a family history of sudden cardiac death in multiple relatives. An echocardiogram shows asymmetric hypertrophy of the intraventricular septum and a normal ejection fraction. Both Aman and Alexandra have cardiomyopathies. From outside to inside, the heart is made of the epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium. Diseases that affect the myocardium are called cardiomyopathies. The three main subtypes are dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Let's start with dilated cardiomyopathy, which is the most common one, accounting for almost 90% of all cases. Now, in dilated cardiomyopathy, the ventricular walls become thin and weak. As a consequence, the ventricular chambers dilate. Because the ventricular wall is thinner, muscle contraction is weaker and the heart can't pump blood efficiently throughout the body. So, we have a systolic dysfunction with normal diastole. Okay, when it comes to the etiology of dilated cardiomyopathy, the large majority of cases are idiopathic, meaning the cause can't be identified. However, there are many secondary causes that must be excluded first. Examples include toxins like chronic alcohol or cocaine abuse, nutritional deficiencies like thiamine deficiency, also called beriberi, or selenium deficiency. Enjoying our Osmosis videos? Unlock your full potential with an Osmosis subscription. Get unlimited access to every Osmosis feature and resource with a free seven-day trial. Another cause is myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle, usually caused by viruses like Coxsackie B, but can also be related to autoimmune diseases like lupus. Hemochromatosis is a disorder of iron overload in which excessive iron can be deposited in many organ sites, including the cardiac muscle. Too much intracellular iron can act as a toxic free radical, resulting in cellular damage. Other causes include Chagas disease, a parasitic infection caused by Trypanosoma cruzi, which is transmitted by the kissing bug. A clue on the exam would be someone who recently traveled to South America and also has other clinical features like periorbital swelling, megaesophagus, and megacolon. Also, during pregnancy, the body demands more cardiac output. Sometimes, the heart fails to meet this high demand, and we get something called peripartum cardiomyopathy, which commonly occurs in the last trimester of pregnancy and up to six months after delivery. Dilated cardiomyopathy can also result as a side effect of some medications like doxorubicin, a chemotherapeutic agent, or trastuzumab, a monoclonal antibody. Even severe emotional stress can cause a form of dilated cardiomyopathy called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. This is thought to be related to the disease of catecholamines, which in large amounts can be toxic to the myocardium. Examiners try to get creative when it comes to these causes. For example, a case of breast cancer treated with chemotherapy after which the individual develops heart failure. This should raise your concern for doxorubicin toxicity. Another example would be an individual with anorexia nervosa who develops heart failure, raising your concern for a nutritional cause like beriberi or selenium deficiency. The next subtype of cardiomyopathy is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Unlike dilated cardiomyopathy, the heart muscle thickens in a concentric fashion, which means the cells make more myofibrils, which are stacked on top of one another. Histologically, there's myocyte hypertrophy, but the key is myocardial disarray, which is very high yield. This means that they're disorganized and have bizarre shaped nuclei. Now, it might seem that the heart getting thicker is a good thing, but the problem with a very thick ventricular wall is that it impairs the ability of the ventricle to relax during diastole, which reduces ventricular filling. In other words, we have diastolic dysfunction, but systole is not impaired. 
Another feature is that the intraventricular septum gets thicker, particularly on the side of the left ventricle. This asymmetric hypertrophy can obstruct or narrow the aortic outflow tract during systole or ventricular contraction, and this increases blood velocity through the smaller opening and pulls the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve toward the septum, which further obstructs the left ventricular outflow tract. In such a case, we call it hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or HOCM. At the same time, that mitral valve doesn't shut all the way. Blood can leak back into the left atrium, called mitral valve regurgitation. All right, now most cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are familial and are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, so family history is an important clue. Mutations commonly affect genes coding for components of the cardiac muscle, such as beta-myosin heavy chain and myosin binding protein C. Now, a commonly tested cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is Friedrich ataxia. This is a trinucleotide repeat expansion disorder, where the death of myocytes leads to difficulty pumping blood through the heart, which thickens the heart's lower chambers or ventricles, leading to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, now in restrictive cardiomyopathy, the heart muscle is stiff, preventing it from relaxing during diastole. So that's another cause of diastolic dysfunction, but systole remains normal. Causes include primary diseases, which are often idiopathic or secondary systemic diseases. An important primary cause is endomyocardial fibrosis, where excessive collagen tissue is deposited in the heart muscle. Sometimes this disease is associated with an elevated eosinophil count and deposition of eosinophils in the endocardium and myocardium, in which case it would be called Leffler's eosinophilic endocarditis. Now, secondary causes are much more common, with the most common being amyloidosis. Other secondary causes include sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, and radiation therapy, all of which cause fibrosis of the myocardium. All right, now regarding clinical presentation, in all three types of cardiomyopathy, over time, the heart may be unable to do its job effectively, leading to heart failure signs and symptoms like fatigue, dyspnea, and swelling of the feet. And because cardiomyopathies affect the cardiac muscle as well as the pacemaker cells that run through the cardiac muscle, they can lead to arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, ventricular ectopic beats, ventricular tachycardia, or fibrillation, and atrioventricular block. Another high-yield fact is that specifically, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in people under 35 years and is especially more common in athletes due to the development of ventricular arrhythmias. Another thing to bear in mind for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is that due to the obstruction of the aortic outflow tract, perfusion of the brain can get low, so individuals can present with syncope, which is a transient loss of consciousness. Diagnosis of cardiomyopathy starts with auscultation, so dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathies cause an S3 heart sound, which is the result of blood rushing and slamming into the dilated ventricular wall during diastole. On the other hand, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy produces S4 sound in the apex of the heart. This sound indicates that the atrium is contracting against a thickened left ventricle. Remember, though, that the S4 sound is not specific for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and can be present in other diseases that thicken the left ventricle, like hypertension or aortic stenosis. If there's also obstruction, as so in HOCM, a systolic murmur between S1 and S2 may be best heard at the left sternal border. This is often described as crescendo-decrescendo ejection murmur because it gets louder as blood first rushes out and then softer. What you absolutely have to know for your tests is that the intensity of this murmur can change with various maneuvers, depending on how much the outflow tract is obstructed. If the person squats down or does a hand grip maneuver, systemic vascular resistance increases, which makes it harder to eject blood out and increasing afterload. This means that the ventricle has more blood stretching it out and so it becomes less obstructed and the murmur becomes less intense. If the person stands upright or does a valsalva maneuver, venous return decreases, which decreases preload, meaning less blood stretching out the ventricle before ejection, 
So there's more obstruction and the murmur's intensity increases. Okay, a final point here is that since HOCM is sometimes associated with mitral valve regurgitation, a hollow systolic murmur may be also present, meaning it lasts throughout systole. Then comes the ECG, which is usually abnormal in a variety of different ways because there's significant remodeling of the cardiac muscle in all of the cardiomyopathies. For your exams, just remember that restrictive cardiomyopathy, especially when it's due to amyloidosis, leads to low-voltage QRS complexes due to diffuse infiltration of the heart muscle. But diagnosis of cardiomyopathies relies primarily upon echocardiographic evaluation, which makes it possible to measure the thickness of the wall and dimensions of the cavities and the pericardial space, as well as the left ventricular function expressed by the ejection fraction. In dilated cardiomyopathy, the echocardiogram generally shows left ventricle dilation, with a normal or decreased wall thickness, and a low ejection fraction, since there's systolic dysfunction. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by increased ventricular wall thickness and a normal ejection fraction in the early stages of the disease, since systole is not impaired. Finally, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, the heart's shape and dimensions tend to be normal, but generally there's a normal ejection fraction. So on the exam, don't exclude a myocardial disease based on a normal ejection fraction. The goal of treatment in cardiomyopathies is aimed at symptom relief and ensuring that the heart continues to function. Another key is to prevent myocardial infarctions and congestive heart failure. For dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathies, this includes treating the associated disorders, such as heart failure with medications like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, as well as sodium restriction and diuretics for individuals that develop fluid overload and congestive symptoms. Digoxin may also be used, since it helps increase force of contraction. For hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cessation of high-intensity athletics is recommended to avoid sudden cardiac death. Treating the associated arrhythmias may be done with medications like beta blockers or non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, like verapamil. For your exams, it's also important to remember the medications that are contraindicated in case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The concept behind this is that the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction worsens when there's less blood stretching it out. Therefore, medications that decrease venous return or systemic vascular resistance, like dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, nitroglycerin, and ACE inhibitors should generally be avoided. Positive eonotropic medications like digitalis are also contraindicated, since they tend to increase the force of contraction, which can actually increase the obstruction as blood is being forced out of the ventricle. Additionally, in all cardiomyopathies, those prone to fatal arrhythmias need implanted pacemakers or defibrillators. Finally, some individuals need a left ventricular assist device or an LVAD, which is a mechanical pump that assists the heart in distributing blood. And in extreme cases, someone might have a heart transplant. All right, as a quick recap, cardiomyopathies are diseases of the heart muscle and are classified into dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy is characterized by thin ventricular walls and a reduced ejection fraction. It's mostly idiopathic, but secondary causes include alcohol use, beriberi, and medications like doxorubicin. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by asymmetric hypertrophy of the intraventricular septum and is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in people under 35, especially athletes. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is the least common and is characterized by ventricular stiffness, which restricts diastole. Causes include primary diseases, like Leffler's endocarditis, or secondary diseases, like amyloidosis. Okay, back to our cases. Amon is presenting with features of dilated heart failure, like shortness of breath and lower limb edema. Considering he has a history of chronic alcohol use, and his echocardiogram shows dilated ventricular chambers, the diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy is confirmed. Alexandra presented with multiple syncopal episodes. Her family history of sudden cardiac death is certainly concerning. Alexandra's echocardiogram shows asymmetric hypertrophy of the intraventricular septum, 
a key feature of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or HOCM. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.